now it's time, everyone. Time to get down to business. <coughs> so I guess I forgot to tell you one thing. <gasps> yeah, I'm a dad now. Is that why I haven't been uploading any devlogs in like uh, three months? Yeah. Oops. Though, to be fair, I have been working on the game uh, in secret. So today I thought we'd go through all the features that I added since last time, but first, need something to drink. I hope you have your favorite beverage with you. Let's do this, boys! So first up on the agenda today is gonna be fixing the camera. So this game is meant to be played in either a third-person perspective or top-down. But as you can see, when you're playing this top-down, the camera gimbals because we're using a cinema machine. But we're gonna fix that today by adding two cinema sheets. The first camera that we're gonna use is a cinema machine free look camera. And this is going to be used for the third-person perspective. And we can easily get a good view of our character by using three orbits. And then, when we use our scroll wheel to scroll out, by code we can change the radius of these orbits, which means that we can zoom out from the character. But when we are, this is the tricksy, the tricksy part of the equation. When we've zoomed out to the maximum, what it does is, in the code it changes, it switches the camera by changing the priority from the Freela camera, which has priority 10, to the Cinema Machine Virtual Camera, which is a camera that's hovering above the character. And that camera then gets a higher priority and is using a framing transpose and all we need to do with this camera is then whenever we hold down the middle mouse button we just pivot this around the world up. Easy. So when we're in third person perspective, hope the camera isn't annoying. <laughs> we're in third person perspective, as you can see it gimbals. And we can zoom in and look at the character but when we zoom out you can see that it's a little snap. Bloop. It snaps, and then when we're in this perspective, when we use the middle bars wheel, it just rotates, as I said, round the world up, and it doesn't gimbal anymore. Hallelujah. Next up on the agenda is going to be the random room generation, but uh, there's a lot to talk about, and uh, as we say here in Japan, <coughs> my throat became dry. So I'm just gonna go and grab some... Uh, cal... <coughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, kelp is soda, of course. It's a popular drink here in Japan. And how does it taste? <laughs> oh, yeah. Delicious. Also, I'm a little bit hungry, so I bought some uh, cream. Hold on. Enough messing around there. N now let's get serious. <laughs> Let's see, let's get serious, let's get down to business. So, this dungeon is of course comprised of a lot of rooms, and every room is also randomly generated, and every part of the room is randomly generated. So there's a lot of random generation going on here. So as you can see, every room consists of walls, it consists of these uh, pillars that we have here, and so objects inside, such as urns here, and we have a coffin and stuff like that. So the room class, which has now become uh, way too long to be able to properly explain. What it does, it does it take all these child objects that I talk about and it sends parameters to them. As for instance, if we take this wall here, it sends the parameter of size. So it can change the size of the wall, it can change the facing of the wall depending on where it needs it in relation to itself, and it can also send a seed. It sends a lot of parameters, but that's the easy ones to go through. And this is of course true for all the- And as if that wasn't enough, we can also nest these child objects. So we can have a child object inside of a child object, as for instance we have here. Here we have a candle holder and we can randomize the seed, which just randomizes where some candles are placed and the size and stuff like that. But then we have objects like this, for instance the pillar wall here, which randomizes what it selects from a series of child objects and all these child objects are also randomized. Okay, that was a lot to take in, so here's how I would summarize this. First of all, we have the room generator, which we haven't talked about too much yet. This is the class which is responsible for placing all the rooms in relation to each other. 
Then these rooms by themselves create child objects such as walls, coffins and so on, and these are called props. These props then can be either taking their data from other props or they, it can take it directly from a prefab such as a 3D model that you've done in Blender. And when I say combine prefabs, I don't mean that we just copy paste a prefab 1000 times that would create 1000 game objects and the game would not run super smooth. Instead what we do is that we go into the prefab and we copy the actual mesh data 1000 times or however many times we need to and then we combine all the meshes that share a material into one mesh and that's what we've done for instance here we can look at this room 14 we've combined all this mesh data right here because they all share one material okay so we talked about how to generate the individual rooms but we haven't talked about how to actually generate the dungeon yet so Full disclaimer, I don't think that this algorithm is perfect by any means and it needs upgrades, but here's how it works so far. As you can see here, it never creates mazes. I think there's very good algorithms on the internet for creating mazes, but I don't want a maze structure. I know uh, from playing a lot of Path of Exile that I don't like maps which are like mazes because they're just annoying and you need to backtrack all the time. So instead what this algorithm creates is that it has a path from one end of the dungeon to another end of the dungeon and there's maybe one or two or three branching paths that lead nowhere. I would ideally though like these paths to connect back to the main path, but that's something I need to work on later. So if I change the C there for instance, you can see that it can create any variation of this. It can place things in different places and it can also place enemies in different rooms. So how does this algorithm work? Well if you know the game Snake, if you remember Snake, if you played Snake on your Nokia 3310 then you know this algorithm. It's very very simple. All we need to do is snake our way through empty space and try not to hit ourselves in any ways because that would create a dungeon where we overlap our rooms and that would work. So, first of all we just place down a room. As we're done here we have a red room in the middle of the dungeon and then we choose a 2D direction at random. It can be either up, it can be down, it can be left, it can be right. I don't mean up such as up in heaven or down in hell, I mean down a 2D direction. Think of this as a platformer. We're going down, right? So the first branch, as I call this, has branched down. This means that if we go down we can never go up again until the branch finishes. But we can go down, we can go right and we can go left. If we go right or left, we cannot go the opposite direction. So if we go right, we cannot go left immediately because that would, you know, overlap ourselves. So if we go left, we cannot go right until we've gone down <laughs> one move. And that is essentially the entire algorithm. Except for the fact that we of course have more than one branch. That's what creates this branching snake-like factors <laughs> that we have here. So after we added one branch, what we do is we check all the rooms that we added so far and we select the leftmost room, the rightmost room, the topmost room and the bottommost room. We take one of those at random and then we branch in that direction. So if for instance we select the topmost room, we can only branch top because that means we can never overlap, we can never build on top of our already existing dungeon, which is exactly what we want. So when we only have two branches, this can look something like this. We branched to the left first, and then we selected one of the bottommost rooms at random. It can have selected any of these rooms, and then it selected the starting room actually, and then it branched down from that room. And if we add multiple branching times here, the number of times that it can branch, and we randomize the seed, you can see that it starts to become a somewhat interesting dungeon. Somewhat. So the reason that I chose this algorithm is actually because rooms can have different distances to each other depending on what's inside of the room and also depending on how they are connected. So for instance you can see here that these two rooms right here, this room and this room, has a further distance from each other because they are connected with a door. But these two rooms right here are closer to each other because they are just connected. The last change that I've done since last time is that I actually added support for these props, as I call them, to have particles. So, for instance, these candles now have fire. <laughs> and these incense burners now have small embers coming out from the bottom here. And we have some puffy smoke coming out there and some uh, smoke coming out there also. If you're interested in getting these particle, particle effects, they're actually free on the package man. Just search for Unity Particle Effect, something like. Where is it?
And you are? It's -a me, the YouTube algorithm. And well, what are you doing here? I'm just here to take those the views. No, the those are my views. Oh, I can explain to you, senor. You see, you have subs zero uh, percent and non subs a uh, hundred percent. That's why you can take all your views. <laughs> I guess it's time that you uh, check out a little. The thing down there.